Hi, I'm David Gregg, and I'm the director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. You're about to watch the recording of the Rhode Island Woodland Partnership November 2021 monthly meeting. This month, the featured presentation is by uh, two folks from the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative, which is a program based at the University of Vermont that uh, monitors forest ecosystem health. So we're going to hear from Alyssa Schuett, and she's going to talk to us about monitoring indicators that can document impacts of climate change, uh, with a particular focus on identifying gaps. And Jim mm -hmm. Duncan, who's going to talk about monitoring indicators that can allow us to track changes in disturbance regimes. Now in the Northeast, disturbance regimes like fires and storms and cutting uh, are one of the main determinants of a uh, forest ecosystems organization and, and character. And so any changes in long-term changes in disturbance re regimes could have a serious impact on the forests in the region. And so looking out for those long-term changes could be important. Uh, forest ecosystem monitoring cooperative tools are under development and the conversation in this meeting offered some I hope, valuable feedback for their developers. So if all of this is new to you, hopefully you'll have a chance to look at a cross section of methods and issues. Enjoy. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. Um, why don't we just go around and do our typical round of introductions, um, since we've got some new, new faces and our guests know whom they're presenting to. I'll uh, start out. I'm Christopher Riley. I'm the co-coordinator of the Woodland Partnership. Um, and I divide my time between a um, part-time role with the University of Rhode Island and my practice, Sweet Birch Consulting. And I'll kick it over to Kate. Thank you, Christopher. Kate Sales, the other co-coordinator of the Rhode Island Woodland Partnership and the director of the Rhode Island Land Trust Council. Uh, Paul, you're up. Good afternoon, everyone. Paul Rosselli, speaking to you from the Great White North president of the Barrelville Land Trust. Great. Uh, how about Joe? Hello, uh, my name is Joe Jamraz. I'm with the New to Conconet Hill Conservancy uh, City Park in the city of Providence. Thanks, good to have you here, Joe. Um, Thank you. Wolf. Hello everyone, my name is Wolf Mueller and uh, I'm a recent forestry graduate from Paul Smith College and I have my own uh, consulting practice here in uh, Rhode Island, helping small landowners uh, develop management plans. Uh, I've been working in partnership with Mark for the last year or so and look forward to doing more work here. Excellent. And speaking of, uh, let's uh, look over to Mark. Hello, uh, Mark Tremblay, forestry consultant and um, outreach coordinator with RIFCO, Rhode Island Forest Conservators Organization. The Forest Landowners Association here in Rhode Island. Thanks, Mark. Good to have you here again. Let's go over to Alana. Hey, everyone. Alana Russell. I'm the URI Biocontrol Lab Manager and the State Rhode Island State Coordinator for FEMC. Thanks. How about David? Hi, everybody. I'm David Gregg. I'm the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. David, and we'll go over to Amanda. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Freitas. I'm the Rhode Island Wildlife Action Plan Community Liaison. Um, that's a group project with Division of Fish and Wildlife and the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Excellent. Uh, how about you, Pat? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, Patrick Langloy, uh, Conservation Planner for Southern Rhode Island Conservation District. Thanks. And Chris. Uh, let's see. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Modisette. I'm the state resource conservationist with USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service based in Warwick, Rhode Island. All right. And we'll go over to you, to you tomorrow. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Tamara Asvitsatarova. Um, I'm a resource conservationist with the NRCS um, Warwick. I work with Chris. Thanks. Great to have you joining us. And uh, Jim, how about you? Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Duncan. I'm the director for the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. Thanks for joining us. And uh, finally, Alyssa. Hello, yes, I'm Alyssa Shute. I am the Community Engagement Specialist for the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. Thanks so much. We got a good uh, group with, you know, core members here today and, you know, some new faces and, um, you know, really happy to have, you know, the two of you from the FEMC joining us and, you know, learning more about your new offerings. So without further ado, uh, why don't we hand it over to you and um, learn more about uh, what you've been developing and how we can use it. Hey, thanks. I think while Lisa is pulling it up, um, we'll just let you know Lisa is going to kind of walk through one of our tools and then I will uh, tap in with some of the disturbance pieces and um, we'll have time for questions and any discussion you might have uh, at the end. Great. Thanks for letting us know how it'll work. All right. So now I am going to share my screen. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. So yeah, so thank you very much for inviting us today. Um, and just like Jim said, I'm going to be presenting um, on the first tool that we'll be talking about here today, which is forest impacts of climate change. And then he will take over to talk about some disturbance tools that we have. Uh, to start, I want to introduce you to the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative, which is a collaborative effort among federal agencies, state agencies, and the University of Vermont. Our mission is to serve the Northeast Temperate Forest region through improved understanding of long-term trends, annual conditions, and interdisciplinary relationships of the physical, chemical, and biological components of forested ecosystems. In order to do this, FEMC has a regional committee of cooperative members who, com who come from different disciplines in different states, together decide on a regionally relevant question that addresses forest ecosystems, and the, then the FEMC carries out the project. Um, in this past fiscal year, there were two projects, and um, that's what we will be talking about today. So again, I will be starting with this project and we'll walk through the tool and take some time to explore um, some of the monitoring gaps that we have um, been analyzing. And then Jim will talk about tracking disturbance shifts, tracking shifts and disturbance. Um, so this project, the Forest Impacts of Climate Change Monitoring Indicators, came about from the recognized need to understand more about the impacts of climate change on forest systems. Of course, there's plenty of research and effort into this topic already, but we wanted to bring it together, bring all of the data together to um, be able to identify thresholds or patterns of change. So this project was developed to identify the most important factors or indicators that shift under climate change as demonstrated by work that has already been done and identify methods for monitoring these factors and put them in one easily accessible place. So this is a tool that we developed to help practitioners explore what monitoring is being conducted and the protocols that are being used in order to facilitate the development of ne a network of monitoring for indicators important to understand how climate change is impacting Northeastern forests. When we consider the impact of climate change, um, we wanted to think about what we're using indicators as a way to understand that change. So these indicators are not representing direct abiotic changes such as precipitation or temperature, but rather indirect impacts of, at the ecological level that are being felt as a result of abiotic changes. 
So for example, at a community composition level, you can think about changes in the presence or abundance of invasive plants. It's anticipated that as climate conditions change, such as increases in disturbance events that cause forest gaps or changes in frost period, invasive plants, particularly from warmer climates, will become more prevalent. Although it's difficult to anticipate exactly how plant community will play out, changes in invasive plant abundance can be a clue that, it, that climate change is impacting forest ecosystems. Another example at the species level is brook trout. Brook trout are particularly sensitive to water temperature for breeding and as stream temperatures increase, brook trout populations will likely be impacted. Therefore, tracking the populations of brook trout can give important information about the impacts of climate change. And by monitoring these critical indicators of impact, we can see how baselines are shifting, identify where, more easily where they start to change and gain more insight into priority areas of concern as complex climate impacts unfold. And as we developed this tool, we had several guiding questions that were helping us to track and, and keep us focused on what we were interested in doing. Um, so one, the first question is, what do we need to track to know when a forest starts to change? What are the key indicators that we need to monitor? Um, there are countless indicators that could be selected for the project, but within the limitations of this project, we wanted to narrow it down to a, a set of indicators, critical indicators that are equally important across the entire region of New, New England and New York. And then the second question is, how do we make monitoring efforts more consistent and comparable? So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We know a lot of monitoring is already occurring. So we want to create a single place to go to answer these questions. Where is monitoring happening already? Where are the gaps in monitoring? And how can someone find a replicable standardized protocol for establishing a monitoring effort? And then we have several outputs that were uh, a result of the development of this tool. The first is the visual mapping tool. So we, when we go look at the tool, we will be able to see a map and be able to see where monitoring is happening across the region. There's also a filterable database in order to quickly find studies and protocols that um, show us these indicators. And then finally, a gap analysis to recommend areas of effort based on where monitoring is not yet happening. And with this tool, we have four categories that were used to organize each of the indicators. There were a total of 24 indicators that were selected. And I, we're going to step through and look at each of these in a moment. But I, I just want to make sure that it's um, important to understand that the subcategories and categories that these indicators are placed in were created after the, the indicators were selected. So first indicators were selected and then we placed them into categories for ease of organization. So the first is aquatic systems and there are four indicators that were selected um, in two different subcategories. And that was vernal pool biodiversity and stream biodiversity with um, wood frogs, macroinvertebrates, um, stream communities, and brook trout populations. And then next we have forest systems as the next category. And this has um, five different subcategories um, that were selected with um, a some, several of these have multiple indicators in each subcategory, as you can see. But so there's understory plants, pests and pathogens, asynchronicity of pollinators, growing season shifts, and the extent of sensitive communities. And then the next category are trees with different um, stand health and regeneration um, storm damage and biodiversity being the indicators for trees. 
And then finally, wildlife with bird biodiversity and mammal biodiversity being the um, two different subcategories. And so now this is, um, I just wanted to show you a little bit about using the tool. Um, and this, I'm going to walk through, this is the main table that you would be able to see um, and look at to, in order to filter and find something that you're interested in looking at. And so here I am showing how we can filter. Um, so right now in this, I have all of the indicators are selected. Um, if you were able to select the drop down arrows, you would be able to see all of the indicators listed out um, just so that you know you can select and unselect anything that you're interested in. I do also want to point out that I have only selected Rhode Island. So in this table that is represented here, um, these are all studies that are happening in Rhode Island. I also want to take a moment to talk about some specific terms um, and how we use them. So in this case, a, we talk a lot about studies and studies are monitoring efforts or projects based in the region. Um, and a study can cover more than one state and can also include more than one indicator um, and it could be ongoing. So there are some that are ongoing and some that are term limited. Um, and then next is indicators. And these are eco the ecosystem process or species of focus that we just walked through and looked at. So this could include um, the wood frog, for example, or, and again, um, multiple indicators can be included in a single study. So in, for example, in the FEMC forest health monitoring program, that includes quite a number of indicators that are included in that study. And then next are the protocols. And these are, again, the replicable methods for, used for monitoring. Um, these are being pulled from the associated studies. However, there could be other protocols that are not tied to a study that we could add. They're not in this um, data as it is now, but that is, um, so all of the protocols are tied to a study. Um, and then finally, the data sets. And when data sets were available, we made them, um, we linked to them. However, that was not a primary focus of this project. Um, and so then I also want to show, so that's filtering using the table. I also want to show filtering using the map. So that would just be instead of the table tab selected using the map tab. And this time I did select a few things. So this time I only have the hemlock woolly adelgid and southern pine beetle selected. Um, again, this is only in Rhode Island though. And then what you get is you, um, there's a modal that pops up with the available studies that um, are for these selected indicators. So there are six studies for these two indicators. Um, if I were to select on one of these um, in the list, we then get a new modal that pops up. And this shows us more details about the study info. So you can see that this forest inventory and analysis program covers the entire region. Um, it's been going on since 1930. Um, it's run by the USDA Forest Service. Um, and then you can also see that there are two protocols that are associated with it. And so then if you were to select that, you see um, these two protocols and you can get access to those. Um, so I just wanted to, that's just a pretty brief look. And later on, if there are questions and we want to dive into using the tool a little bit more, we can um, go directly to the website. Um, and next I wanted to talk about the gap analysis that we have just started. So this is preliminary, but um, is important in understanding 
um, sort of some of the next steps and any recommendations that might come out of this tool. Um, and so, so this is an overall picture of the entire region. And that is that there are 24 indicators across all seven states of New England and New York um, with a total of 346 studies in the tool and 168 associated protocols. Um, and also overall, each state had a similar proportion of studies for each indicator. And then zooming into Rhode Island, um, Rhode Island, while there were the fewest studies in Rhode Island, there were actually the most studies proportional to its size conducted there with 55. Um, there were 22 indicators included, so there are a few that are not included in Rhode Island, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And there are a total of 14 protocols that were associated. Um, and I do want to say it's important to note that if the same study or monitoring effort takes place across multiple states, it's counted within each state. And so numbers as you look at the tool, some of the numbers might um, look a little strange or off from what I'm showing you, and that's because of the way things are counted. Um, but across all of the states, again, there's similar rep proportional representation for each indicator. Um, and then we'll get into some of the um, discrepancies in some of the coverage. So this is a pretty you know, big table. This is all just for Rhode Island. Um, and this is looking at any discrepancies in coverage based on different topics. So on each of the indicators. And um, in general, most of the indicators have at least one protocol specified. There are a few that don't have any protocols associated with them, but most have at least one. Um, I do want to point out the bird biodiversity is very well covered, and that is not just true for Rhode Island, that is true for all states. And the mammal biodiversity is not well studied. So I mentioned that there were only 22 indicators for Rhode Island as opposed to 24 total. And that is, um, there are no studies available for snowshoe hare population or northern flying squirrels. There actually is one for moose, but I, in this table, I only have active studies. So that was just a short-term study um, for moose that is not included in this count here. Um, but so the, the two things that are not included are the snowshoe hare and the northern flying squirrel, which you know is likely a result of um, the habitat and range of these rather than not you know, Rhode Island not having um, monitoring programs in place for that type of project. And it's also worth noting that neighboring states um, have similar, um, do not have any studies for snowshoe hare or northern flying squirrel either. Um, which I'm showing here in the geographic coverage. These were just a few um, coverages that I pulled um, relating to neighboring states of Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, again, there are no studies in Massachusetts, Connecticut, or Rhode Island for the northern flying squirrel at all. Um, whereas the bird biodiversity has very well covered um, for all states. Um, the, the two that are, you know, there are a couple that are not quite as well represented across states, um, the stream biodiversity, uh, macroinvertebrates, and community composition of understory plants um, were a little bit um, less well represented. And then finally, the, um, we're also looking at the regionality of the studies. That is, if an indicator is studied as part of a multi-state or fully regional program. Um, some indicators to note are the aquatic systems indicators, that these are primarily statewide programs using um, 
you know, protocols that are for Rhode Island. Whereas the, for example, trees have much more coverage with multi-state and regional studies that um, help to, to cover and understand what, what impacts might be occurring as a result of climate change by having these multi-state and regional studies occurring. Um, and forest systems and, and birds have you know, fair representation of regional and multi-state as well. Um, and then this is just um, sort of a final big takeaway of the coverage and where um, there are some gaps in monitoring occurring. And this is not just for Rhode Island. These were kind of similar across the entire region. But so again, there's low coverage in, in northern flying squirrel snowshoe hare. We, you know, kind of understand why that is. Um, but there is also low coverage in the aquatic community composition. Um, there's, again, high coverage in the bird biodiversity. And then some of the other categories have some, you know, not quite as many invasive species abundance and not quite as much understory composition for forest systems, but, you know, are well re represented in other forest system indicators. And so then with that, um, that is my walkthrough of um, the forest impacts of climate change tool. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jim to talk about the next tool. Just as we, before we hand it over to Jim, um, might we take a, a break for any questions from, um, from this first, first part of the talk? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say we, we also will cover some next steps for both of these tools um, at the end if you, uh, after I give my piece if you want, or we can um, pause here and do questions on this tool. Um, I'm happy to do it either way. Sure. Let's, let's take a quick pause and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll roll on. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a question and may, maybe I didn't, didn't catch it up front. Who does the monitoring? And how, how are they doing them? And how often are they, are they doing the monitoring? These are monitoring programs that are established um, that it's not that FEMC is doing the monitoring, it's that these are monitoring programs from um, the Forest Service, um, you know, the, the um, yeah, is it, is it universities? Is it private groups? Is it nonprofits, land trusts, kinds of Audubon societies? Is it citizen oriented at all? How, all, how, yes. All the, all the, all the, <laughs> I, great. David, I see your hand up too. Yeah, well, I have a related question. Um, I've been sort of, it's sort of been a little bothersome to me in the past that people have um, cataloged as monitoring projects, what are essentially one-off research projects. Um, and a good example of that is um, some of the monitoring projects listed in the Rhode Island Wildlife Action Plan are basically, you know, three-year grant funded research projects. And people put them in as monitoring. And yes, they might've developed a protocol or they tested a protocol or something like that. But the implication is that we have a much richer monitoring environment than we, re than we really do. And I think, Paul, I, that sort of speaks to your point because I, I don't think a lot of this monitoring is really happening. And uh, that's my concern. Yeah, that, that, that was the, the, the thrust of the, of the, of the question, uh, uh, particularly how often and who is doing it. Yeah, where how are they how are they funding all this stuff? Yeah, if, if it's a yeah. one-off, I kind of scratch my head and say one-off. You know, well, okay, I don't know. Mo monitoring happens at multiple times over a period. It, it, yeah. Hmm. Well, thanks for you know bringing bringing up these good good questions and points. Um, you know, why don't we we'll move into you know, Jim's part of the talk and um, you know is going to talk about those the next steps at the end and then. You know, we can broaden it into a wider round of questions, and I bet some of ours will be answered along the way. Sounds good. 
I will share my screen. All right, so um, I'm gonna give a quick overview of the disturbance tool, I'll probably spend a little less time um, on this one, uh, mostly just trying to, again, highlight how the tool could be used, but then also um, what some of the information we see in Rhode Island specifically. Um, so this project uh, was conceived of um, from a desire to understand whether regi regimes are changing for disturbance in our region, especially as climate change uh, starts to impact forest systems in the Northeast. Uh, so this is you know, a big topic. There's lots of research and work being done on this in various ways. So this effort is really to look at what are some of the kind of foundational data sets that we could rely on to track these or to use to track these over time. And what are they telling us so far? And are any of those trends or changes significant over time? Um, we also are interested in uh, kind of what other resources are out there for either initial baselines that could be repeated or ongoing monitoring that's being conducted. Um, so we looked at a uh, selection of drivers that had enough data and were also of relevance or interest to forest systems. So here we are looking at extreme weather from flooding and high winds, uh, pests, which we kind of broke into advancing invasives or those that are moving into the region or through the region from a source established invasives such as El Dispar or um, brown tail moth and native pests which are endemic and native in forest systems in the northeast. We also looked at fire and drought. Responses were uh, originally included um, by request of the advisory committee and the larger FEMC governing group but uh, the tie to specific forest events was harder to look at. So rather than analyzing trends, we just compiled existing resources available for uh, some key responses that you could look at as indicators of forest disturbance. Uh, those could include stream macroinvertebrates, which can be very sensitive to clearing of upland watersheds, uh, invasive plants, which can move in after disturbance, and cold water fisheries, which show temperature sensitivity, uh, something Alyssa kind of alluded to before. And when we talked about what we wanted to track, what the metrics of change would be for each of these disturbance, we looked at three groups. One is extent, is the amount of the area affected by this disturbance changing? Uh, is the severity of the impact of the disturbance changing? And are disturbances happening more often? Um, in that terms of frequency. And so once we combine those metrics with those drivers, uh, the outputs of this project are filterable database that you can use to find existing uh, monitoring and research programs, uh, trend analysis when possible of the key drivers and a mapping, uh, mapping platform that you can look at uh, kind of a similar view as climate indicators where these are happening. Um, so this is the site. Uh, we can drop the link in the chat in a little bit, but um, the, I'm not going to walk through detailed how to use it because I wanted to spend some time on what we found. Uh, but just know that in this site, you can get some of the final outputs, including a very detailed uh, technical report, which describes all the source data sets, the methods for analyzing them and the outputs. Um, we have this web tool where you can use any of these boxes to both explore causes of disturbance as well as responses to disturbance. Um, and this includes a, a program uh, index so you can look through what's available. You can filter by the disturbance type or the state that it's occurring in. Very similar to climate indicators, you can get a sense of what resources are out there for examining these disturbance regimes. And then for a subset of data sets that had sufficient yearly resolution, enough observations in each state, and uh, ongoing support so that it's going to be a continual source of monitoring information. We did look at um, analysis and highlights from those data sets. Um, so just blowing that out a little bit, as you go to each of the disturbance pages on the site, you the kind of main meat of the tool is getting these uh, analyses of frequency, extent, and severity for different disturbances. Um, this one is showing high wind events, uh, which have been increasing over the region um, for the last 20 years. Uh, so this gives you the ability to kind of toggle into a specific state, state uh, add on trend lines. It tells you how it's being represented here. We're showing both the average number of high wind events and the total number of high wind events. 
And then it summarizes the trends and the highlights out of the data. And we do this for each of the drivers. You can click through the tabs on extent and severity to see graphs and explore graphs both at the regional and state scale for those. And you can download the, uh, the data that you're looking at, the actual processed data. And further below, you can access the source data that we was used to create it. So I um, encourage you to look through the tool a little bit on your own. Um, and happy to answer questions if you want me to show you something more detailed after uh, we go through this. But first of all, what do we find? Um, looking at flooding and wind specific to Rhode Island, we didn't see any significant trends. At the larger regional scale, there are some interesting trends in wind in that we're seeing an increase in high wind events, but a decrease in overall severity. In flooding, it's pretty much, there's no trend information that are no significant trends over time that we were able to find in the NOAA and uh, in the NOAA data. Looking at fire was a little bit more interesting. We counted a fire as anything with acreage reported using the fire program analysis, uh, fire occurrence database, the FOD. And uh, we had a range from 92 to 2018 with 125,000 fires, but many of them are in New York. So New York had a significant impact on the regional patterns we looked at. Um, overall, regionally, are fires becoming more frequent? Yes. Are we burning more overall area? No. And are we burning more area at once in a single fire? No. That, that just means that the trends, if it says no, it means the trends don't show anything significant over time. Looking at Rhode Island, um, there were some, there's a slight decrease in the average area burn and the max burn area, um, not very large, but there are significant, statistically significant increases in the reported fires for both Massachusetts and Connecticut shown here. This is one of the graphs that you can pull out of the report, out of the tool. So uh, not, not huge numbers, but statistically significant increases over the uh, 25 year or 26 year span of this data set. Looking at drought, which is categorized as probably many of you know by the drought monitor into the different levels of dryness over time. Um, we looked at uh, all of those drought level status uh, or quantifiers from the US drought monitor from 2000 to 2020. So are droughts becoming more frequent at the region? Uh, no, not in any category. Uh, are they becoming more widespread? The area affected is uh, not showing any significant trends up or down. And are they becoming more severe? No, the regional results were pretty mixed, uh, but there is a slight indicator that abnormally dry is increasing. Um, Connecticut and Massachusetts have a statistically significant increase. Rhode Island is not statistically significant, but you can see that it tracks obviously very well with what you're getting out of Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, so this, uh, this shows a slight uh, uptick in that first level of drought in the drought monitor. And then uh, we really were interested in looking at advancing invasives, uh, specifically emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, and southern pine beetle, but there's just not enough observations to see regional trends at this point. Um, what we do see is uh, one thing that was somewhat interesting is there's a slight uptick in hemlock woolly adelgid mortality in Connecticut, but um, again, it's not it's not enough to really make hay with. So these are gonna be more of a baseline for monitoring as we look at uh, these pests as they move through the region going forward. Um, we can use aerial detection survey data and others to look at some trends there. So I covered a lot uh, of, like I've glossed over a lot of the details, but wanted to give you kind of the high level overview of what are we seeing at the regional scale and what are we seeing at the Southern New England scale in these disturbance drivers. So I'm gonna, end my screen share here and, and kick it back to Alyssa to go through our next steps for both climate indicators and event and uh, disturbance regimes. And I can always pull this back up if there are questions. Great, yeah, so I will. All right, huh. um, so yeah, like we mentioned, we're going to, um, we have several identified next steps. This is specific to the climate indicators, the forest impacts of climate change indicators tool that I discussed. And um, um, 
big part of that is finalizing the gap analysis that we have you know, just preliminary started and recommend any important areas for upgrading or adding um, to the monitoring efforts in Rhode Island or across the region. Um, continuing to, this is a version 1.0, so continuing to add any studies and protocols that are not um, currently tied to a specific monitoring effort or you know, searching for any other, um, or as we learn of other studies, adding them into the database and adding any recommendations and input from experts to help identify um, you know, ideal protocols or, or the standard, best standardized protocols. Next steps for the um, tracking shifts in disturbance regimes are, um, oops, I'm sorry. Um, again, the expert interpretation of the trends, the customizable charting um, to visualize the data of multiple drivers, um, using connecting drivers with responses to mm -hmm. inform research, inform research to connect those drivers to, with responses and continual adding of resources. And then um, I'll, those, so those were both the next steps for both projects. Um, I did also want to mention some of the other upcoming FEMC opportunities, um, just to make sure that everybody is aware about these. Um, first up is the FEMC conference, which is going to be held as a virtual event, December 16th and 17th. Um, and registration is currently open and you are welcome to explore the agenda, which is also available on the website. Um, we have a browse project for Ungulate Browse, um, and that is um, the next project, the next regional project that is being conducted. Um, it's, it's getting started and there will be a working session held at the conference um, to, um, if you're interested in that topic. And also there's a recreation project and that um, there is, first Connecticut is doing their own um, state sprint project, um, but then we also have an exploratory project for the overall region of FEMC. And you may also already be aware about um, a data rescue project that we have that we're working with Alana with to, um, you know, rescue data from being lost to um, lack of archiving or, um, and, you know, just being missed or, or not, not being captured. So that is being ongoing and currently happening. And so with that, I, I'm done with my presentation. I have, um, if anybody wants to ask questions or dive into the websites, um, I'm happy to open the websites up and, and show some things around. Great. Well, thank you, Alyssa, uh, Jim, for uh, you know taking the time to uh, give us an overview of these tools, and you know can tell that you know a lot of work certainly went into them, and you know relates to, to much of our work. Um, but we'll open it up for you know for, for questions that people may have. You know, maybe you know most specifically, uh, you know, first about um, um, the disturbance regimes, and then, you know, more, more broadly. Jim, when you were talking about fire and its frequency, do you know if that data included a uh, controlled burn set by uh, active fire crews doing uh, forest management with the tool as a tool per se? Yes, that, that database should include, uh, can, um, it doesn't discriminate by ignition source, and so that will include controlled burns. I'm wondering more generally um, about you know how the data or you know how these tools you know might, might be used, um, you know, 
um, you know, less less for a you know a state agency or a research project. But if if um, someone's working on a, a forest management you know plan, for for example, um, would it um, you know be tools that be relevant you know at, at, that, at that scale or um, or uh, how would you how would you approach that? Sure, I think that's a great question. Um, these are very broad scale tools, but they can provide important context to a specific land parcel, right? So I think the disturbance trends in wind may just not be relevant for a particular property that someone's looking at or a particular uh, area. But if it is, this can provide context for a kind of a where this property sits in time and in space for potential change. Um, and so if you're looking at a, you know, a project, um, I'm having to think at the regional scale, if you're looking at a a plan for an area that isn't going to be experienced or hasn't been experiencing much range change in drought over the last 20 years, but we know from climate change projections that uh, drought could become more severe and periodic in our region, or higher precipitation could be. This could the disturbance tool can provide some like regional context on what this site might have already experienced. Um, very broad scale, it's going to be pretty big. If you want to dive into the data, you could, but that's probably beyond the management plan writing activity. Thinking about the climate indicators tool, um, I think there's more uh, utility there, especially if you have landowner goals that are interested in tracking certain elements over time and you want to collect that information in a way that's not just going to be specific to that property or that's not just going to be specific to the way you as a consulting forester do monitoring of a particular attribute. So if this landowner or you want to collect data or recommend collection of data that will be usable with other programs or will match the way that others are collecting data, climate indicators could be a really helpful tool because you can look for where are there protocols for this. I've never looked at wood frogs, but where are there protocols for wood frog monitoring that um, that I could recommend here that would feed into a larger effort. So it's not just a one-off, but it's actually part of a larger regional data source. Um, so I think that's the, that's the potential power of climate indicators is to help us reduce the um, heterogeneity of methods and have more regionally consistent data, especially when it's being collected outside of an agency context where there might be long-term support and consistency. Thanks, that, that's helpful. I saw that, or the, the one area where, you know, where there is a lot of heterogeneity. Heterogeneity of methods is uh, you know, the, the forest understory and regeneration and, and, and other attributes, which, which we're all interested in. Um, but yeah, certainly a lot of value to being able to use, you know, similar methods in different places. So something we can think about. Yeah. And I think um, just the, like thinking about that, the other end of that is if we actually do see those being implemented and being able to count yet another study that's using the same protocol and this larger resource, we also then build up our regional knowledge of where we have on existing data, either for baseline or ongoing data collection for monitoring. So I think that's the other benefit is if we can pull in or document the execution of more of these monitoring programs across the region, we also build up our regional resource for tracking climate change. I, I, I have a, a question of, of go along the lines of what you've just been talking about. And I, and I think you answered it, but I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm looking at the different categories on the website, uh, climate change, soil, air, how, how are they defined so that one doesn't spill over to the other or do they, or, or can they spill over to the other? Air, climate, water, soil, um, uh, how, how, how do you separate, how do you keep them, how do, how, how do you keep all the ducks in the row? Sure. And um, I'm thinking that you might be looking at our data archive overall, which is kind of a user contributed data resource. Um, so when people upload stuff, they can add, or we add uh, tags for different themes. Um, and many of those data sets will be tagged to multiple uh, themes. So they're both a soil and a water data set, or they're a forest and a water data set, or they're just a forest data set. Um, so in that sense, like we allow them to spill across. And I think the same is true in climate indicators. Uh, where we have studies that might address multiple dimensions and it's just one component of that study that or that monitoring program that talks about wood frogs or one that talks about soil, one that talks about trees, but it's a larger ecosystem monitoring effort. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, exactly, I'm looking at that, 
at that data set there. But then does that mean that the issue is more severe or less severe based on the number of tags or the spillover into different areas? Like how do you keep it all um, uh, uh, make, making sense so that the data doesn't skew one, one area or another? Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Um, <laughs> well, I think, so looking at the data archive is, is not meant to answer that question of, you know, where are we, where are we putting in too much or too little effort? Um, I think the climate indicators tool, and I'll just drop the link in here just in case um, so everyone has it. Um, or Alyssa just did. So that the, the link that she put in uh, for climate indicators, I think that one really does, if, if, there's a, if there's a gap, it's either because we haven't been able to find it and, or, and so it's not documented somewhere that was easily to discover. Um, so I'm thinking about like understory community composition is one where we haven't seen a lot. And if we don't have a lot of studies in there, that means that we did a pretty significant search effort and stopped when we got to um, 20 basically was our threshold. And some things like tree inventory, there's a lot of methods out there, um, a lot of different methods out there for doing kind of general forest inventory. So we stopped when we hit a certain amount just so we didn't spend all of our time working on trees. So we actually did try and do a consistent search effort to get up to 20 resources per indicator. Um, so if you're seeing a small number in that, it's probably because we didn't have a huge luck finding it. it. may not be there because it doesn't exist. It may just not be easily discovered through the internet or through our network of people. All right, that helps. Thanks. Does that explain it better, Paul? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Thanks. David, you've uh, had your hand up here. Yeah, I have a, a question about the gap analysis. Um, did you consider that a gap might exist in the support for an existing program, or is this just there's a absence of, there's a presence of monitoring or an absence of monitoring? Because when we did the, the Bay monitoring back a number of years ago with the Environmental Monitoring Collaborative, we nearly lost a couple of the metrics because they were the programs weren't being sustainably funded and yet they were again they were being listed as monitoring programs but they were essentially being starved to death and so the gap in that i don't want to add more you know go measure more things while really core uh, metrics that have been measured for you know 30 years are endangered um so that's uh, i'm wondering what you consider a gap mm. yeah that's a really it's a great question. It's making me think about a number of things. So I'm going to try and keep my thoughts to your question in particular, which is, did we consider the kind of program um, support as part of the gap? And no, we, we, we haven't. Um, that said, our, our, our preliminary gap analysis is really preliminary. We actually have someone starting up uh, this week who's really going to dive into a couple of questions that need to be answered in addition to that. One is, you know, is this, a, is this gap should it be there because it should be there? And I think moose is an example of one where you shouldn't see even geographic coverage for moose the same way that you should for birds, right? Um, and then the second question is, is it a gap because we just didn't find the right things and there actually isn't a gap because we just haven't discovered the resource yet. And then once we know that those two are solved for a particular indicator, then we can start looking at that regionality, that geographic coverage. What we hadn't talked about, but I'm thinking that we should, include is thinking about where programs it may be that there is a program in a place but it has ended and and it could be restarted but right now with it offline it's not going to contribute in the same way that ongoing monitoring is so i we hadn't thought to include that but if we can with the existing data i think that's a really good idea yeah it, it's, it's just that there's you know there's a risk that somebody will get a hold of your report and use it as, you know, an argument for, you know, their program getting funding to monitor something that's basically a bonus at the same time that we're losing, you know, I mean, in the, in the monitoring collaborative, it was, it was um, buoys, it was monitoring buoys in the bay, which are essentially completely unfunded. They've been funded with, you know, sort of money found under the couch cushions um, when they were really essential to 
you know, uh, multi hundred million dollar, you know, pollution abatement projects. And um, uh, so I, I just, you know, from a political point of view, the, you know, sort of these kinds of can get out of, they, they get, once they get out of your control, you know, people read all kinds of nonsense into them. So we just have to be really careful about how they're con construed going in. Because that's my point. Yeah, it's a good caution. We'll definitely keep that in mind. Good question. Helpful answer. Uh, Wolf, yes. Um, so I guess spinning off of that, do you have a vetting program for people that want to include their data with this tool or do you go out and find them? How does that work? You maybe answered it already and I missed it, but what, what is the process of bringing these sources into this tool to use? Mm -hmm. See, it was really a, um, a search effort on our part. We were trying to cast the widest net for anything that might be relevant. And then in looking through what material we could find, deciding if it, the, the criteria we use to include it are, is it collecting data that could be used to track change? Not necessarily that it is trying itself to track change, but that it could be used. It has multiple years of data. It has consistent collection across those years. So it's, they're pretty minimal um, bars because I think the goal was not to assess the quality of the effort. Like we weren't trying to assess each method and say whether or not it was a good method, um, but we wanted to get a good sense of what's available and what methods people are using so that others can see that. So it's really kind of, it was on us to seek these out and it, and we're now at the kind of seeking additional solic uh, recommendations if people suggest something to us that meets those criteria, we would include it. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, I have one, one small one. Uh, thanks, uh, Jim and Alyssa. So on the climate indicators tool, when you're able to filter your results of the study table, are you able to select anything that like talks about duration of study? Yeah, Alyssa, do you wanna answer that one? Yes, you can also select for um, time range, you know, like a you can put start and end dates in there. So um, you can certainly filter for length of of project or how long it if it's ongoing. Great, thanks. Well, thanks so much for the, for the presentation. Um, really, you know, glad to you know learn about these these tools and you know the, the you know depth of them and uh, how we may use them uh, in our work. Um, you know, we've you know people participate in the Woodland Partnership. You know, who do um, you know many different kinds of forest related uh, work. And you know also uh, you know how they um, you know tie into the the browse study you know thinking about the oak resiliency tool and you know other um, other efforts uh, that we've been involved with in Rhode Island. So thanks again for taking the time. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great. And you're welcome to participate in, in the rest of the meeting and recognize that you've probably got lots to do as well um, if you um, want to turn your attention to that. Um, Mark, I know you, you were going to sort of move into partner updates at this point, and I know that you said you had to drop off at two, uh, so I wanted to give you the chance to, to talk first. Yes, thank you. I was just typing out a message in the chat, and I'm going to post that um, and just let you know that... Oh, so, we got you on mute there. Bye. <laughs> I was just typing something in the chat to, because I do have to. Uh, I do have to take off. Um, but I was. Uh... You're muted again. Why is that happening? Put your hands up. <laughs> get get, <them. laughs> get get your hands off the keyboard, Mark. Back away slowly from the technology. Okay. So I'll, I'll just explain what I was just typing in and I will sign off. Um, now, uh, the RIFCO's, uh, we're venturing into a little bit of a new initiative on biochar uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a way for uh, woodlot owners, uh, backyard folks to uh, make, convert their 
woody material into um, uh, soil additive for uh, both the soil health and for uh, carbon storage. And um, we've reserved the domain name of biochar-ri.org. And we're going to be trying to sort of do a biochar initiative here in Rhode Island. And we, uh, we have a, a, a workshop scheduled at, at our winter workshop series. I believe it'll be March 5th. And um, so we, got, we went out to the Cape to visit this guy at New England Biochar. His name's Bob Wells and wealth of information on it. He'll be doing our workshop for us. But uh, that's our update from Happy Thanksgiving, folks. I got to go. Thanks Take for care. getting news from Rufco. See you next time. All right. Just going to go around and um, call on people. Uh, you can share an update if you've, if you've got one. Uh, Wolf. Um, I, I have nothing to report. I have been spotty attending these meetings, but I'm glad I can actually make one for once uh, virtually. So, but nothing to report now. Great, good to have you here. Um, how about Joe? Yeah, we're still embarking on a forest management plan up there at New Continent Hill. Uh, we've established a committee and we're looking to get started on that also where in trying to increase our volunteer core, which has uh, diminished over the last year. So uh, that's always a challenge. And um, that's about it right now. And uh, cutting some trees that fell on some trails and just taking care of things up on the hill uh, pretty well. Excellent. Sounds like you're you're moving ahead. Uh, Amanda, you. Hey, I don't have any personal updates, but I realized that I was remiss in not um, letting you guys know about a few additional fish and wildlife staff. I think I probably told you about John Herbert twice and neglected a couple of other people. Um, so Alex Fish came on as our game bird biologist. He just finished his PhD at, in uh, Maine. And but he's a Minnesotan, so he's been around um, and working on different things. And he is, um, I think that the the uh, breadth of his interest is going to um, be bit be bigger <laughs> than just coming on as a game bird biologist. I really think he's going to add to the department. Um, and then depending on how far back you go in several stages, you might run into um, Katie Burns who just finished her PhD in um, Dublin, Ireland. She will be the Rhode Island Pollinator Atlas Entomologist. So we're excited to have both of them on and I apologize for not letting you guys know sooner. Thanks, Amanda. We go again, uh, encourage, encourage them to come check out the Woodland Partnership. It'd be great to have, have um, some more um, consistent participation from the wildlife biologist, but awesome. Uh, how about uh, Paul? Let's go over to you. Um, always have things going on in Burrowville. Sure, greetings again. Paul Rosselli, Burrowville Land Trust, calling you from the great, oh, I said that earlier. So uh, we're continuing our, our quest to reestablish the American chestnut. We've partnered with Nuts and, Bolt, Nuts and Bolts Nursery over in Smithfield. They are a co-op nursery. They grow things like red oaks and red maples and black oaks and chestnut hybrids. And over this last oh, year or so, we've watched a bunch of trees, both on some of the land trust properties and as well as the things we just find around town. And, uh, and, we're, and we planted them this year uh, with, with nuts and bolts in mind. Next year, our goal is to, or springtime, uh, we're, we're planning on planting a hundred of those trees in some uh, clearings on some of our land trust properties. And uh, the idea is to just see what happens. Uh, let, let nature do its course, take its, take its own whatever and do the pollinating thing. And, and who knows, maybe, <laughs> Maybe they'll figure it out because we haven't been able to figure it out uh, with orchards and stuff. So, so we've, just got, we've decided to go that route. We're also uh, about to institute a for sale 
on on some of our uh, some of our seedlings, and and I'm 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 just starting to try to find out how best to do this. The idea is to let nuts and bolts grow an additional hundred with nuts that we've found, and then to sell them to regular folks to plant in their backyard and see see what happens. Um, but there are some issues there with a whole bunch of things I'm sure you can imagine. But but the but that's the idea. The idea is to not only do it on our properties, but uh, to do it to a wider audience. That's our update. Thanks, Paul. Sounds like you're you're scaling up with the chestnut efforts. Uh, interesting. Uh, why don't we go over to um, to David? Okay. Um, uh, well, just a couple of things. I. I, uh, as part of our year-end reporting, I got some numbers from George Christie, who's the um, uh, rare species data clerk at the survey. He started at the end of June, and since then he has entered 254 new rare species records, and that constitutes 107 new element occurrences. So those are 107 new mappable uh, locations and um, those are of plants and 14 new records for animals which constitute 13 new um, mappable locations and so those are the 2020 field data there's a backlog of data from 2017 um, we had a pile about five inches thick of records which previous clerks kept setting aside as problematic and um he actually solved almost all of the problems. So those are, uh, most cases, those are fixes to existing um, data lines, but some, some of that, some of the uh, 254 new, essentially new lines of, of data are uh, those problem cases. So we sent a um, update of the heritage data um, for mapping to Paul Jordan at DEM at the end of July, and we'll do another one before the end of the year to try to get us back on the twice a year data updates. Uh, George has done a ton of QAQC. Um, we've created a couple of new fields that are going to help us manage the data a little better, help us to do better filtering, filtering and sorting, um, which again will help us continue to improve the QAQC. Um, so there's that, and then. Um, I've been working on, uh, some of you will notice I got last month's video up late last night or early this morning. And uh, so uh, I think 26 or 27 people watched the September video. It blows me away. 3.3 hours of watch time on our video. So, hey, you know, if it, it, it we got to just keep, we got to keep providing this important resource to the concerned environmental community of Rhode Island. Um, but in order to do that, I, I wanted to ask you all for some photos of forests. So you'll notice that I've been, so I, I use the, thumb, the thumbnails for YouTube are pictures of forest scenes that I happen to have. Um, but I like to use a different one each month so that visually they'll cue people that it's a different video. Um, and I've, I'm running out of one of good ones that I have. And it, I, I think it's sort of against our principles to, for me to use Vermont pictures or Massachusetts pictures. So, uh, I could use, they have to be landscape, ideally 16 by nine, and they should have sort of big blank spaces or big blocks of color so that I can put the words on them. Um, so anyway, if you have some pictures and, and you wouldn't mind letting us use them as thumbnails for the videos, uh, forests in Rhode Island or interesting ecological, you know, sort of phenomena that occur in forests in Rhode Island that we could, you know, kind of use as teaching moments, we can do that too. So anyway, you can email them to me, dgreg at rinhs.org. And thanks. So that's my update. Thanks, David, for all your all your work on, on behalf of the, the partnership and um, sharing what we're doing with with other people who are interested. <laughs> Go over to Alana. 
Hey everyone, um, I guess for uh, any forest ecosystem monitoring cooperative updates, don't have much. Uh, I will emphasize what Alyssa said at the end of their presentation that their uh, virtual annual conference is December 16th and 17th. Um, and the agenda is online now and registration is $28. Um, uh, other than that, Alyssa, Alyssa also mentioned our Rhode Island, our current Rhode Island Sprint project, which is sort of like, you know, the one year project that they do that they help our state with. Um, that data rescue is largely um, consolidating, archiving, and digitizing our Lymantria Dispar uh, data, EGMAS data that's been, you know, we've had uh, we've been sampling in the state since the 1980s, and uh, that's going really well. I don't have too much more of an update other than they seem to be on track with the project, and I'm really happy that they did it because uh, the data seem to be a little bit harder to find than other than just papers in a file folder. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll go over to Paul Dolan. Uh, we wrapped up three of our grants in the end of September. So we put to bed the geothermal grant and the farm energy grant that we've been working on. Forestry for the birds, that was done, the one with the Woodland Partnership, but we did roll some of the outreach for it into the forestry assistance grant. So we'll be doing the workshop for the natural resource professionals and the NRCS people probably in March with a virtual one hour workshop followed up by a field trip. We're working back on the forestry assistance grant, We're having someone work on the uh, women owned in Woodlot. So that should be starting to take off fairly soon. We're also working with NSAVE on giving, not grants, but technical assistance on where to find grants for farms and small rural small businesses. So we're working for, we're looking for farms that are interested in some form of uh, either the solar, wind, whatever, and then not sure where to start. So we can get them plugged in. Same thing with some small rural businesses. And basically all we need to send them off to end save is one year of their electric bills. So if you have any clients or anyone interested in that, please contact me. And that's where we are. Thank you, Paul. And speaking of the NRCS people, um, let's go to Chris. Oh, thanks, Christopher. Um, I guess, well, briefly, sort of at, at the national level, the uh, department is working uh, within the agency on guidance on climate smart forestry and agricultural practices, uh, you know, that we will be able to use at the local level here at the state level. And we're sort of waiting, waiting for that information to come out that probably will be guidance will be coming out, um, you know, later, oh, maybe by the end of the year or early part of next year. Um, along that lines, we're revamping our, what we call our, our uh, technical service provider uh, process. Those are the, those are the, the professional resource professionals that we use as consultants to work with private landowners. So we we're revamping um, an outdated registry, but along with that, we're also revamping the criteria and the methodology that we use to develop what we call conservation activity plans or management plans. Um, working with private landowners, that's going to be a little bit of a change for the consultants. Interestingly enough, we offer those type of plans in forestry, you know, grazing, wildlife habitat, comprehensive nutrient management. Um, of all the ones we offer, the forestry management plan is the most popular, what we call conservation act activity plan across the country. It also happens to be the most popular, uh, the most widely used uh, conservation activity plan in Rhode Island. So that's um, at least encouraging from the standpoint of the sort of the interest in our programs from, from the private landowners and forestry. Along that line, uh, we did a little deeper dive into um, uh, work productivity planning in terms of where we need to focus some of our resources and uh, <clears throat> the core forestry practices, forest stand improvement, forest management plans, Forest trails and landings are are the most frequently planned conservation practice in Rhode Island. So there's been um, there's been a lot of work uh, over the last ten or fifteen years with our forestry partners, a lot of whom are sitting at this table right now, 
who have um, really generated a lot of interest in our forestry programs with private landowners. When I was first hired, 2005, 2009, we had one forestry contract. <clears throat> and the subsequent 10 to 15 years, I think we've done somewhere in excess or pretty close to $5 million worth of technical conservation, technical assistance to private landowners. So, um, and uh, I think you all, we all <clears throat> recently um, hired a young lady. You all met her tomorrow. Uh, she came to us from Colorado State University. She's a resource conservationist and she's gonna be working on a variety of uh, technical assistance programs that we offer uh, both to our staff and our customers. Uh, and one of, her, one of her focal areas of interest is forestry. So I think that's about it for now, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Uh, Clearly, it's been a busy time uh, with, yeah. with NRCS, with everything you've um, described. Uh, Tamara, would you like to uh, say anything about your, your work or um, an update on projects that are relevant to Rhode Island's woodlands? Um, yeah. I don't have much to input quite yet. I'm still kind of getting the hang of things, but um, I will second everything Chris said. Um, and yes, it's been a busy time and I'm really excited to have joined NRCS and to be part of the Rhode Island Wilson Partnership. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, great to have someone else uh, from NRCS uh, participating in the meetings. Uh, we'll go over to Patrick, who's been waiting patiently. Yeah, hi. Um, don't have too much of an update. Um, just been busy with uh, applications for CSP and EQIP. Uh, recently, particularly with uh, forest landowners. So I have a couple of uh, applications coming up. So yeah, as for the rest of the district, I know there's um, some work being done on uh, the coastal resiliency project down in Weekbog. I'm not involved with that, so I'm not gonna speak on it. So yeah, that's about it. Great, thanks Patrick. Kate, how about you? Sure, you want me to give Scott's updates first? Too. That's a good idea. So Scott Millar um, really wished he could be here today, but he had a prior engagement knowing it's a short week. Um, so a few updates from Scott. He's been assisting several municipalities on solar siting ordinances and creating models and guidances uh, and guidance documents to encourage solar um, in developed and previously disturbed areas and subsequently to avoid um, forest loss. He's also working on solar siting or a solar siting reform bill. Uh, is hoping to get one introduced this session, uh, and he's making some progress in the background, trying to get those details worked out. Um, there are some legislators that are interested that have reached out to Scott, which is positive news. Um, and Grow Smart is holding a workshop on December seventh in Charlestown on a draft conservation development ordinance to reduce forest fragmentation with subdivisions. So that's what's going on with Scott. Um, me, so we have a um, finale of our land trustees coming up uh, this coming weekend. I know Paul and the Barville Land Trust are participating in a few events. This is just an extension of our um, land trust days events so there should there's five or six events uh, happening around the state if you want to go out and take a walk either Friday or Saturday or Sunday check those out um I finished I think fingers totally crossed um the PPA agreements for the RCPP they're over to Bruni and Joe to be reviewed there are already a few issues and we're meeting um after Thanksgiving to figure those out. Hopefully we can swiftly move into the next phase of those agreements. Um, mainly getting prepared for the legislative session. There's just so much going on in terms of the um, governor's 20, the governor's act on climate 2030, ARPA fund, ask, um, bond. There's just so much going on right now. Um, I've been working in the background with the ECRI folks on putting together um, a ARPA ask for those um, recovery funds uh, that covers uh, forest conservation in two categories. First, it asks for 
um, an expansion of solar energy to preferred sites, which includes mapping. And it also includes an ask for funding to remediate sites in previously disturbed areas so that they're pad ready for solar energy. I think that that's been what the biggest gap has been um, with the solar companies asking or saying it's too expensive to develop solar. Um, we need to develop it in forests. Uh, the sites aren't ready, they're hard to access. If we can direct some of the funding to remediation of those sites, we can guide solar development to those areas. Um, and another part of that is including forest conservation as climate change policy. Um, I, we haven't officially released this ARP, ARPA ask, but as soon as it comes out, I will share it with the group. Um, so in two places, we call out solar siting in the four bullets that we asked for, which is pretty big. Um, it feels pretty good to be involved in the ECRI political committee. Um, I feel like forest conservation as an option is being heard, which is pretty, pretty good and pretty important. Um, gonna be working on the bond issue heading into this year. Nothing's really changed, no updates um, since the last meeting. And hopefully I know Scott, in Scott's update, he's working on solar siting policy. I'm hoping that we can meet um, next week to figure out how we can work together on that. So stay tuned. Um, I think that that's, that's it. Just a lot of getting ready for 2022. <laughs> I think that's all I got. Thanks, Kate, for all that you do. You think you have a lot right there, and um, great to hear that um, sort of have you, you know, particularly at the, at the table at, at ECRI, um, you know, bringing, you know, forests uh, you know, more into their, their policy mix and, and you know, having, having you right there. Um, so, so some updates for me, just as, I, as I had um, uh, said in the, in the in email to the partnership list, but the Rhode Island Woods website has, you know, been updated to a, to a new theme and some, some modest, you know, content edits um, with that in the, the chat here uh, right now. So I um, encourage you to update your bookmarks and uh, share that, um, you know, receptive to your ideas for the expanded Woodland Partnership sec section. And if you have um, events, uh, you know, that you'd like me to, to post there, you know, that's, that's part of my job in, in maintaining the site. Uh, so you can, you can be in touch with me about that. Uh, second, I want to, you know, encourage people to um, use the, you know, the Oak Resiliency Assessment Tool. It's, it's, you know, just about to get, you know, what I think is a final round of, uh, you know, tweaks and updates, you know, thanks to the, the good folks from the gym and uh, esteemed from the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative um, and the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science. Um, but, you know, in addition to um, it, it, you know, being a fairly, um, you know, straightforward and, and, you know, quick way to provide an assessment, you know, of a, of a given given property or land area, it'll be really interesting to, um, to hopefully get regional data or from around Southern New England uh, as it gets more. Um, um, so uh, feel free to share that. I uh, the so you mentioned the uh, adaptive silviculture uh, for climate change. You know, project is, is getting underway in, in Rhode Island. That's the you know ex extension of the existing uh, University of Connecticut uh, you know research project with the addition of the um, the site in the Decapit Preserve down in Richmond, and what they are done over in Connecticut in putting together the details, you know, before, you know, implementing the uh, sort of silver cultural prescriptions on, on the ground is to invite a group of uh, local or regional, you know, foresters out to um, get a sense of the site, you know, provide input uh, and so forth, so that it's not uh, just me and, um, you know, Tom Worthley and uh, other, you know, Folks from from UConn doing that, and Will, and Will Walker, and we're not sure just exactly what that form that is going to take, um, but um, a heads up for that this this coming winter um, through the Woodland Partnership will, will probably be a good way to recruit people for that. And then finally, just wanted to you know um, uh, bring your attention to the uh, the notes from the strategic you know 
plan update discussion that we started at the last meeting on the policy and economics um, section of the plan, you know, we'll be returning to that, you know, in the other focus areas, uh, stewardship uh, and education. If you have feedback on that, um, you know, invite you to share it uh, with me and Kate. Maybe be best to do it just to us and not not reply old fashioned. And uh, and think you know if also if you have ideas on on how to go about the strategic plan update process, I, I do think it's more challenging to do it you know through Zoom or or out in the field than than being able to sit around a table. Um, but I'm open to your your thoughts about that. Um, but that, that's what I have. Um, I know you know, looking ahead to next month, um, I think, you know, Kate and I are, um, you know, cooking up a, another, you know, Woodland Partnership uh, outdoor meeting and, and walk, you know, before we head uh, right into the, um, uh, the, the dead of the winter, as, as it were, you know, likely to the Rifco Woodlot, in which we'll, we'll be able to uh, test out the, the tool there and, and get different uh, opinions and feedback on that. I think we uh, may need to send out a, a doodle poll just to schedule it since there are some some conflicts, you know, including the, the FEMC conference on the on that third Thursday of December. Um, so we'll be in touch with that. Uh, does anybody else um, or have any, or, or any questions or updates or other information they'd like to share now? No. Nope. Right. Well, thanks so much to all of you. It's great to have our, our you know, core group um, and um, others, you know, including new folks here today. And want to wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving. Hope you have the chance to get out in the woods, walk out some, all some of that turkey, um, maybe on a Land Trust Council sponsored walk, you know, at, at one of our uh, Woodland Partnership members' properties. Now come to ours. No, ours is better. We had beer. Herbal is <laughs> beer. Yeah, we had beer. beer. Bears beer. or beer? Beer. Beer. Two E's. Two E's. Both. I want Maybe both. both. <laughs> well, Barville has beer. Yeah, beer. Gloucester beer has more. bear. No, well, who cares about bear? No, we have beer. Well, you really, you really can't go wrong. These are these That's are right. good, good, just good decisions, good choices that people have. But, Friday, three have a good three holiday, months. and um, hope to see you um, see you in person outside next month. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day.